afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. It's time to start. So thank you for coming to the second Saturday science of the of the, the semester, of all semester. Remember, we have four. Uh, the first Saturday of September, October, November, and December. So please join uh, also in November and December. Uh, today we are fortunate of having a professor join us now. Uh, he's a professor in the physics department of, of sorry. I am in the physics department. The <laughs> <laughs> department of LSU. And how long have you been in LSU? Five years. Five years. And before? Before that, University of Houston. Houston. You got your PhD in MIT, right? MIT. 1993? 1993. And yeah. after that, I was in Germany for a long time. All right. And he's going to speak about the song of ice and fire, seafloor spreading at the North Pole. Very exciting. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, and welcome everybody, and thank you for being here. Uh, I'm John Self. I want to uh, have a uh, shout out to our folks from the College of Science that I, that I see over here in the, this corner. And, and in this corner, we have uh, quite a few folks from the Department of Geology and Geophysics. Eric, raise your hand. You're from G and G. And, uh, and, uh, and they have a uh, a table on uh, interesting stuff back there. Uh, in fact, I'm going to come and grab two things off that table before my talk. Uh, I'll bring you back. Um, okay, so uh, I, want, I want to also thank a lot of people who are here. And you can see some of their names up on the screen here. There, uh, uh, there are a lot of people who've been involved in this project throughout the years, and uh, a lot of the very uh, close friends of mine who I've uh, uh, been fortunate to work with for many, many years. And so this is, if I put all of them on here, it there wouldn't there would be room on the screen. But um, they're now all over the world, but most of them work with me as students in one way or another. And uh, this is how I form my research uh, expeditions, is from people who've been my students uh, in classes and as advisors. All right, so um, yeah, let's get started. So the fundamental question uh, is where the volcanoes come from. And volcanoes right there are, they're these enormous superhuman uh, uh, frightening phenomena on the earth, right? And they also, for us, in art and literature, symbolize the most uh, violent and dangerous and darkest of human emotions. To find in uh, movies, they always it's always symbolic of, in this case, the dark side of the force that uh, that Darth Vader has his headquarters on the volcanic planet of Mustafa, right? And that's where Anakin and Obi Wan Kenobi uh, do to the death, or so they thought. And uh, but so, but why are there volcanoes? We don't really think about that. Uh, we know everybody knows about volcanoes, but most people, and even many scientists, never really thought about where does that liquid rock come from that makes lava turns the floor to lava in your bedroom, right? And it's like you know, at some, at some level, it's. Uh, it's a game that everybody has played. But where does it where does it come from? And a lot of people don't think that much any more about that than about like where does electricity come from? Right? It comes from a plug. Uh, uh, but in fact, just like the electrical plug, there's an enormous, uh, complex series of events that have to happen in order for rock rock to turn to liquid and then be able to fall out of the earth. And a volcano. And this is what I've been studying my entire life. Uh, because this is a question that I um, became entranced with. Okay, so short, quick answer, and then I'm going to talk metal melting. Uh, uh, but, but let me give some detail on that, and I also promised you the North Pole, so I'm going to bring that in for you. Uh, okay, but first, uh, so I said mental melting. 
let me see the uh, laser pointer here. Uh, we stand on, here on the top level crust, which is a thick part of the crust. Most of the Earth is made of oceanic crust with water on top of it. Uh, and underneath both of them is something called the Earth's mantle, which is made of a green rock called peridotite. And that is, uh, I'll get ahead of myself, that is this rock I'm holding right here. And, uh, and there's a lot of it. There's 3,000 kilometers thickness of peridotite. That's from, that's east, that's from New York to Los Angeles in thickness underneath the Earth. Uh, the Earth's mantle is uh, over two thirds of the mass of the Earth. And so it's really, really, really a lot. Whereas the crust that we stand on is really only very, very tiny, much thinner than it shows in this diagram. Okay, so, uh, so this rock that the mantle is made of, and this word is going to come back again and again, is called peridotite. And it's made of the mineral olivine. We have a couple of pieces of it back here, and I have a piece of it here. And basically, this is, in order to form a magma, this is what it has to melt. And uh, there's a couple of different ways to do that, but I'm only going to tell you about one of them today. Uh, the most important one. So I draw into the diagram here a. Uh, the mantle melting and then that melt rising up through the mantle atmosphere and erupting out of the volcano. That's kind of how it works. Okay, the mantle melts and erupts out of the volcano. Uh, it, it creates a rock called basalt. And uh, I have a piece of basalt here, and we have a, a piece or two of it back in the back, too, that you can actually look at and touch. You're uh, welcome to do that. Okay, so that's, that's how it works fundamentally. Let's get into some details. And first of all, we ask the question, why? Why would the Earth do such a thing? Why would the Earth melt? Are there any of my students here? I see at least one student here. Uh, plate tectonics. Say louder. Plate tectonics. Plate tectonics, absolutely. Uh, the answer is plate tectonics. <coughs> All right, and so now that you've had your first geology lesson, uh, anytime asks you, anybody asks you about the Earth, why does it do these things that it does? And at some level, the answer is always plate tectonics. And, uh, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that great revolution in science, but uh, but then the follow-up question always comes, uh, and we ask of our students, how? And the answer to that for this talk is C4 spreading. So this talk is mostly going to be about C4 spreading. There are other ways of making volcanoes, uh, big volcanoes like Hawaii or uh, the Cascades, and uh, that's a talk for a different day. Or you're welcome to take my course, uh, Geology Tab 1 at LSU, and uh, I've been with that for a lot of people. No, I didn't have the registration code. But, uh, but uh, anytime you see me um, on the uh, schedule booklet, I'm, I teach that course quite often, and I'm happy to have new students in it. Okay? So here, the Earth is divided into major tectonic plates. This is uh, something that became known around the time that I was maybe uh, in diapers or in elementary school. It's no longer a revolutionary theory, although the revolution that produced plate tectonics is really quite exciting story. But so these tectonic plates include both regions of uh, ocean crust, which, uh, which is in the dark color here, and continental crust, which is in the greens and the browns. Everybody can see where the continents are. Everybody knows the shape of the continents. And in between these major tectonic plates are regions of sea floor spreading. And so this is the thing. There, these sea floor spreading areas are made of volcanoes. They're the most volcanoes on Earth. Uh, we don't see them because they're under three miles of water. So they're kind of hidden away from our view. And so getting there to work on them is also a little uh, cumbersome and difficult. It either gets worse 
and I'll talk about that. When the particular spreading sector you're interested in is also underneath a few meters of ice at the North Pole. So I will get to that. But, uh, but let me talk about seafloor spreading a little bit first. Okay, so this is a blow up of uh, a sort of idealized mid ocean ridge or seafloor spreading zone where the tectonic plates are spreading apart to separate the continents from each other. And at the same time, they're creating new oceanic crust. And they do that by a process of mantle melting, like I just described to you, uh, followed by the eruption of the volcanic melts at the surface to form uh, a basaltic crust. And so that basaltic crust is about five kilometers thick. So five kilometers, that's that's maybe from here to the LSU campus, just as, just as a, it's not a bad pit, but it's still a pretty, um, uh, compared to the mantle, it's tiny, but still it's an awfully big pile of basalt. And, uh, and these tectonic plates spread apart at a rate of a few centimeters per year, maybe even less. And the variations in that rate of spreading uh, also control, to some extent, the uh, degree and the kind of partial melting that happens underneath the ocean regions. Okay, so if you want to find out some fundamental things and understand where all volcanoes come from uh, by understanding this melting process, it's a very useful thing to find out where the thinnest volcanic crust is and where it's undergone the least amount, uh, where the mantle has undergone the least amount of melting. Okay, and so this is the point, all right, great. Um, because all of that's controlled by the spreading rate, let's just find out uh, where along this entire system here, 70,000 kilometers of volcanic system, is this spreading rate the least? Well, it turns out, it turns out, unfortunately, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, that the very slowest spreading along the Mid Ocean Ridge system is at a place called Gackle Ridge. Okay? And uh, the volcanic crust is pretty much independent of the rate of spreading. This is the full spreading rate on the x axis here. On the y axis, uh, the crust thickness in kilometers. And so um, the ocean crust is about a constant five, six kilometers thick. By the way, each of these triangles is a month of time of a uh, seismic ship at sea. There's an amazing amount of work went into just producing this diagram. And here, at the very ultra slow end of the spreading spectrum, is that ridge in the high Arctic. So here's so it's at essentially the North Pole. The North Pole isn't quite there. The North Pole is just here. Uh, and I won't be talking too much more about the North Pole itself, but I'll be talking about Gaffel Ridge, which is this mid-ocean ridge that comes up the seam between the uh, uh, North American and Eurasian continents that comes up and it disappears. It actually pivots around this place in Siberia, which is pretty cool. So it goes this the Mid Ocean Ridge goes essentially from a few centimeters per year here in the North Atlantic to zero at the opposite end of Gaffel Ridge. And the very slowest rates of seafloor spreading on Earth are here under the Arctic Ocean. Well, so that's interesting. Maybe we ought to go there. And but um, and sure, we ought to go there, but first we have to take a quick detour through parts of literature. And so let's do that. Um, so the, the history of Arctic exploration starts in the 19th century, in the sort of early part of the 19th century, with the uh, romantic in, your, impulse of Europeans to explore the farthest parts of Earth that they possibly can. And, um, but this is linked to our, just our, our drive to explore and new technologies that allow people to uh, access some of the more remote parts of the earth. But it also inflamed the imagination of, of romantic, the romantic period in Europe. This 
painting is very famous painting by Castaneda Trindren, which is sort of a, symbolizes the romantic period of art literature. It's called Wanderer Over the Sea of Fog. And, he, and he's climbing up to the very top of the Alps into this very forbidding zone that's like, uh, it's like outer space to them. It's very frightening. It's very superhuman. It's the, uh, and this uh, trend in art and literature is known as the sublime. It's the combined joy and fear that we feel while contemplating forces of nature that much, are much greater than ourselves. It's, you may feel this emotion when a volcano makes landfall nearby. Uh, when I see a, a volcano, on, uh, I'm sorry, a volcano, a hurricane, uh, makes landfall in Louisiana, uh, and I see this on the radar, it gives me the same incredible feeling of, uh, of fear and also uh, beauty. Okay, every, everybody recognizes him, of course. Who is that? Frankenstein. Frankenstein, right? What does Frankenstein have to do with the North Pole? What does he have to do with the high mountains? Has anybody read this novel, Frankenstein, by Mary Shelley? A few people have, right? Uh, most people have seen a variety of different Frankenstein movies, and they're familiar with, you know, like this uh, Shandling monster who's uh, scary, uh, but in fact, and I picked this picture for that reason, uh, he's ugly, all right, but he is a kind of superhuman. Uh, and the story of his creation, his literary creation, runs through a 19-year-old girl telling ghost stories at a, at a villa in the high house. And they, um, this 19-year-old girl created all of science fiction in uh, 1820. Uh, when she wrote a story about a man's technological creation that was greater than man, greater than himself. The, the monster was ugly, but he was bigger, stronger, faster, and smarter than the guy uh, Omega. And this is uh, uh, Dr. Victor Frankenstein right here, who, said, who created a monster who, uh, wanted, who hated him and wanted to destroy him. And so, Frankenstein is kind of a stand-in for our fear of technology, right? The, the technology will rise up and destroy us. And that's certainly a, a, a theme in literature that, uh, to this day, people, like, who is scared of AI, um, right? Okay, some people aren't scared. Maybe what AI can help. But, uh, uh, but so here's the other part of it, though. Frankenstein takes place at the North Pole. Why? Because the North Pole is like outer space in the 19th century imagination. It's the furthest place anybody could imagine being. And, uh, and so uh, the, the entire novel is narrated by uh, a man who's on a whaling ship in the North Pole, and the monster goes by on a sled. And, uh, and they see him from a distance, and then finally, Trailing behind the monster, chasing the monster, is an exhausted Dr. Frankenstein. All right, and uh, uh, who then tells his story and dies. And, uh, and eventually the monster also makes an appearance on this uh, whaling vessel that's frozen into the ice. Right, and, uh, uh, and this is all happening in 18, or written in 1820. And it's because the polar regions are the 19th century version of outer space. So if they're writing science fiction, they're writing science fiction not about space, which they know little to nothing about, right? But to the most remote, of, uh, the most remote place they could imagine, the North Pole. So the North Pole at that time was uh, a great big literal white spot on the map, about which nothing was known. There was a whole lot of speculation about what the North Pole could be. It was uh, uh, including, well, could it be an archipelago of islands? Could it be a shallow sea? Could it be, an, uh, could there be people living there? Could it be, and this is a serious uh, theory at that time, could there be an enormous hole at the North Pole leading inside to the interior of the Earth, where we could still find 
uh, prehistoric creatures wandering around. Okay, and this was people. This was not just the realm of speculative fiction at that time. People actually thought this might be the case. And uh, but so, uh, if you're going to talk about the history of Arctic exploration, you can't get around talking about this man. So this is one of the most remarkable people who ever lived. His name is Friedhof Nansen. And uh, this is a picture of him as a young man uh, enjoying his standard sport, which is skiing. And uh, the thing is that skiing didn't exist. In, we all know about skiing, right? Everybody see it on the Olympics. Uh, that sport didn't exist in the US or Europe uh, when he took the sport up. It was only known to uh, uh, remote villages in northern Norway when he found out about it, and, uh, and known to native people in the northernmost reaches of Europe. They used it as a means of getting around. And so he was a biology student, and he got his PhD in biology. And uh, during that time, uh, during his, actually during, he interrupted his studies uh, because he and his friends decided, well, let's do something really fun. Let's uh, ski across Greenland. So, this is all already by itself a kind of like uh, uh, maybe Elon Musk level of I'm going to shoot myself into space. Nobody ever expected him to come back. And, but come back he did. He and his friends set out. Uh, he had shipped out on a whaling vessel as part of his studies and had learned native techniques of living in the ice from native people who lived in the ice margin um, and used those techniques of survival to ski across this, the southern part of Greenland in 1887. Well, so when he got back, he immediately became uh, an international celebrity. And he went from town to town, first in Europe and then in, in the United States, promoting the sport of skiing. And this is how the sport of skiing became introduced to European and American uh, audiences. And immediately, people in the US and in Europe took up the sport of skiing, cross-country skiing, downhill skiing, ski jumping, uh, uh, not invented by Nansen, but popularized by Nansen. And uh, <coughs> he finished his PhD, went on a speaking tour uh, as an international celebrity, maybe kind of like I'm doing right now. <laughs> um, and uh, except I'm not, uh, you'll see. It's incredible work to do. So by the time he was 30, he had uh, uh, published his PhD on the cell theory of nerves. Uh, at that time, nobody knew what nerves were because they don't have obvious organelles that you can identify. And he was uh, he was a microscopist and studied staining uh, with for, with his PhD advisor the staining of cells in order to identify their organelles and show that uh, nerves are cells like any other. This later won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Uh, part of the work that he was involved in, although he didn't get the Nobel Prize in Medicine, his PhD advisor got the Nobel Prize in Medicine uh, as soon as it was established, one of the very first ones. So he did the first crossing of Greenland on skis, and he brought the sport of skiing to Europe and America. That's pretty good for a 29-year-old. Uh, while he was on his speaking tour, though, he learned an interesting story because he was the suddenly the uh, one of the great catapults of the famous Arctic explorer. He learned the story of a ship, an American ship called Jeanette, and uh, Jeanette was um, uh, an American whaling vessel that was founded in the ice off of the coast of Siberia in 1883. And here's a funny thing that happened then. Just after that wreckage that was identifiably from this whaling vessel washed up on the northern coast of Greenland. Somehow, having crossed this unknown expanse of ice. So wreckage found in 1887 took only only took four years to get from the site of the wreck to the site where it washed up. 
and somehow had gone almost across the North Pole in so doing. Okay? And so this gave him an idea. Uh, and he was very entrepreneurial and set out to raise money to build a spaceship or build an ice ship to, uh, to do the first crossing of the North Pole via ship. Never been done before. It was a crazy thing to do. He was certain to die that way. Uh, and uh, all those other things that people always say about entrepreneurial explorers. He raised an enormous amount of money. Uh, he went to the Royal Geographical Society, and they said, they laughed at him. Uh, they said, no, you're just going to die. We're not going to be money for that. Uh, but, uh, but he got a personal check from the King of Sweden uh, that covered a substantial amount of the expenses. And so um, what he did was build uh, uh, a spaceship. And so this is called the Arctic Drift Hypothesis, that it would be possible to drift passively through the ice to the North Pole and discover what the North Pole is. All right? And this was his idea. <laughs> so he built the ship. Maybe, uh, I don't know what it cost in today's money, but it's certainly, uh, if you want to compare it with Starship that's being uh, built in Boca Chica, Texas today, maybe it's a similar kind of undertaking filled with a new technology that had never been used before at sea. For example, if you see this windmill here, that is an electrical generator, which uh, in, in, in the 1880s was not a very common thing. So they, uh, they used electricity for lights, for heating, uh, for uh, all kinds of things, because they've got plenty of wind up there. Okay, so in the court, so Nansen worked really, really hard. He was on uh, developing this spaceship to explore the North Pole, and, uh, and so he built the first oceanographic research vessel called Fram. Now there are hundreds of oceanographic research vessels, including uh, one here in Louisiana. Uh, we're actually getting a new one shortly. Uh, but Nansen built the first one, and it's called Fram, and this is the diagram of it. And you can see Fram today. Fram is currently in Oslo Harbor on its own island uh, with a dedicated museum. And if you've ever gone to Oslo, Norway, I highly recommend that you visit the museum island and visit Kram. It's an amazing little ship, a terrible ship to sail in because it uh, was designed to be in the ice. It was designed to be frozen into the ice with a profile that would allow it not to be crushed. And it was built in the 1880s and there's no excuse for anybody to ever get their ship crushed again in ice after this ship was built. Um, but so along the way, he invented the Nansen model, which is a water sampling system that you can lower down to the depths of the ocean and get water samples from a, a, a particular depth. This is still in use today. I have used the Nansen model in my own exploration. Uh, the Nansen sled, which is based on a native design that he adapted for use by European expeditions and was uh, hugely superior to the uh, sledges that uh, people had used before, and also the Primus stove. Okay, this is maybe one of his, uh, he was, he invented, he co-invented it and helped develop it for use in the high Arctic. Uh, this is a liquid fueled stove that heats its own fuel. So if you've ever used a camping stove that takes like white gas or kerosene or something like that, uh, the first thing it does is loop that through a gas generator and then it burns the kerosene as a gas. And so this is a huge advance in gas stoves, which otherwise have been super smoky and couldn't reach high temperatures. And this is the exact same principle that nearly every spaceship today uses. It's exactly how spaceships work. They uh, take their liquid fuel, run it through a gas generator that, uh, that heats it in the flame of the rocket exhaust and injects the gas into the combustion chamber, exactly the way the Primus stove works. So if you want to look at Starship today as a further evolution of 
the finer scope that Nance had helped develop, then that's actually not far from all. So it was a five-year mission. Her five-year mission was to explore the farthest north, uh, to seek out high Arctic islands and the civilizations that they lived in, um, to sound the ocean depths, and to measure the ocean currents. This is an undertaking that had, all been, uh, had been done before, measuring ocean currents and ocean depths, never before attempted in the high Arctic or the ice. And if this sounds like the mission of the Starship Enterprise to you, that's not wrong either. To explore strange new worlds. This is exactly what he set out to do. Um, so this is the voyage of the Fram, plotted on a modern map. So this and this is the Gapo Ridge that I mentioned to you earlier. So Fram entered the ice in September 1893 and was lost to human understanding. There was no radio at that time. They didn't have a radio set with them, no cell phones, no satellites, no nothing. They simply vanished into the Arctic wastes, never to be heard from again, or so everybody thought. They had supplies of work for five years, in which they could probably stretch to seven, particularly if they shot everything that, uh, that uh, ran by the ship, which is what they did. Could never do that today. Um, and they drifted with the ice on board the Fram through 1893, 1894, 1895. And along about the middle of 1895, Nansen realized this is where it gets really crazy. And it's almost hard to believe that this happened, but it happened. He realized he wasn't going to make it to the North Pole on board his ship. So what did he do? He jumped out of the ship with Nansen, with Nansen's sleds, his trusty Lieutenant Delmar and Johansson, uh, a couple of muskets, and a big, a big bag of ammunition, supplies, and a couple of sleds. And off they went, skiing towards the North Pole as fast as they could go. Well, so they didn't make it. Long story short, they didn't make it to the North Pole. But here's where, here's the amazing part. They also didn't die. <laughs> uh, and this is really um, because people still, you know, go tracing around the North Pole with the advantages of GPS and uh, satellite navigation and satellite phones and, and all of that. And they die on a regular basis. This might as well be, uh, the Arctic is one of the deadliest places there is. And he went skiing off towards the North Pole and got the furthest north of any human being ever before. Uh, 86 degrees, 30 something seconds. And whereupon, rather than die, which would be the normal thing to do, he turned around and skied south uh, towards this place, which is Franz Joseph Land. He spent yet another year on, he and Johansson spent another year shooting everything blue on Franz Joseph Land and eating it, uh, stayed alive, and made it to the southern tip of Franz Joseph Land where they met up with a British expedition, and returned to harbor in a uh, Norwegian town with this British expedition. They wintered another year, and returned to harbor in the Norwegian town of Tromsø on the same day that Fram, with the rest of the crew, came out of the ice and made it to Tromsø. It's a, it's a pretty amazing story. There's a, there are many books written about it. He himself wrote a, uh, an autobiography uh, about his adventures. And, but he discovered a lot of stuff along the way. So first of all, the main thing that he discovered uh, was that there are no islands. No civilizations, no hole to the interior of the Earth with uh, dinosaurs crawling around. Uh, he got all the way up there, and it was just ice. Ice over a vast ocean. So he discovered also that the Arctic Ocean is deep. And uh, there's a story of how that, how that came about. They made soundings. They only brought 200 meters worth of, uh, of cable. But they found ways of uh, stringing together every piece of the ship's cable to establish the deepest depth they actually measured was 
over 1,500 meters, right? So many thousands of feet, and much deeper than any depth that had ever been measured before. Led to the conclusion that the Arctic Ocean is a deep ocean, like the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean, that had never been known before. He discovered the transpolar drift, which went from being a hypothesis about how wreckage could get from one side to the other to an established fact. There's simply no way around the, uh, the voyage of the Fram through the ice passively as being a major ocean current that occurs through the ice. But he also measured beneath the ice, the water, and discovered that the Gulf Stream that starts out all the way down in Florida and goes past the east coast of North America actually extends all the way up underneath the polar ice cap. This is an amazing feat of science that made him one of the most renowned scientists uh, in the world at that time. So he became the first professor of oceanography in the world at the University of Oslo. And when they established a professorship for him, we have an entire department of oceanography here at LSU, and it all started with Manson. Uh, later, he became Norway's delegate to the League of Nations after World War I, and he helped establish, he established uh, a high commission for refugees uh, that went by a different name at that time, but it later, one-to-one, uh, -one evolved into what we now call the UN uh, High Commission on Refugees, which uh, uh, made its business to uh, help displaced people find a home people who were displaced by war, for which work he was granted the Nobel Peace Prize in 1928. Uh, and so, but his ocean floor map that he established by making this incredible leap into the unknown lasting many years, stood for 90 years as a definitive map of the uh, North Polar regions. I have a copy of it. Um, which I sometimes show, but I don't think I have it in this talk. Well, so, that was a technological feat that was unmatched until the late latter, until the very end of the 20th century. And it wasn't until the invention of the nuclear submarine that any further exploration of the Arctic Ocean floor could occur. Now, so I just discovered this today, that if you go on and Google, uh, the uh, first woman on a nuclear submarine. The Navy will tell you that that occurred in 2010. And it's actually not true. The first woman on a nuclear submarine was the chief scientist of something called submarine to, with a bolted on civilian science package, bolted onto the bottom, that mapped the seafloor along the Gackle Ridge underneath the Arctic ice cap. And so this is their map that they produced. It's a very relatively low resolution map. And uh, during the course of that project, which lasted uh, several cruises and at least three years, they also surfaced at the North Pole through the ice. They, they, so the, the Arctic ice cap isn't all that thick. It's not like the three kilometers of uh, ice in Antarctica. The, the North Pole is an ocean as Manson discovered. And you can actually surface a suitably modern uh, uh, nuclear submarine through the ice, and this is what they did. So this is where uh, we enter into this. This is, this is where I came in. I was part of a series of expeditions to the Gackle Ridge along the same portion of Gackle Ridge that the SciSex project mapped. And uh, this is my crew from 2001 and uh, 2003 aboard this ship, which is the uh, motor ship Polarscher. And that's a German ship. I was a German scientist at that time. This is the American ship Coast Guard Travertini and the crew aboard her. And we were mapping this region, the Gapo Ridge, which is the northern extension of the Mid Atlantic Ridge that I showed you earlier in this talk. It was a huge undertaking. The two ships cooperating together because nobody knew 
whether it would be possible to map and sample the ocean floor through the ice. We've been doing it out in the open ocean for decades, but nobody had ever attempted to do seafloor sampling in the ice. So uh, three cruises, a big one, a more cruise in 2001, and two other cruises in 1999, which was a uh, test study carried out by my graduate student, Eric Pellegrant, and then in 2004, um, a single ship expedition on the polar stern that uh, I led. So this is our map, similar uh, bathymetric map with darker colors, or the bluer colors indicating the deeper areas, and the uh, lighter colors indicating shallow areas. And I can I, I wish I could tell you everything about this map because there's a lot of detail. But the main thing is that we made this map, uh, sort of a, a kind of last, it was one of the last really unexplored sec segments of the global mid-ocean ridge seafloor spreading system, system. We also carried out seafloor sampling operations, and there I, I am, a younger version of me, taking the first rock out of the gigantic rock dredge. And uh, anybody, a couple of people here have seen a rock dredge. This is the biggest one anybody has ever seen. And, uh, and taking samples, one of the samples from this table is, uh, is right here that I've brought with me, a piece of with the rock that makes up the Earth's mantle. Does anybody remember what that was called? It starts with a P. Perinatite, awesome, awesome. <laughs> Okay, so we carried out ge geophysics operations along with the sampling. We uh, actually flew helicopters with uh, craft members, and we did sampling operations. These red spots indicate where we sampled basalt. That's this rock here. Uh, the volcanic rock, basalt. And we sampled this green rock, peridotite which is shown as green spots here. And where the peridotite predominated, the magnetic signal was lower, showing that the crust was thinner. We also carried out seismic investigations. This was not me, but Wilfred Yoka, who was on the ship as well, leading the geophysics expedition, uh, measured the thickness of the crust using seismic techniques. All right, and this is another, this is uh, where there was uh, basalt crust, and this was basalt crust was actually thinner than we had predicted. And there was peridotite crust, where this nano peridotite is actually exposed directly on the ocean floor without a volcanic crust on top of it. This was a, probably probably first ever. Peridotite had been found in other places, but this is probably the only place in the oceans. Um, there's actually one other, uh, where the peridotite is exposed, the deepest layer of the earth is exposed without volcanic layer on top of it. So this is all of our sampling operations. Each spot is about six to eight hours of ship time. Uh, so we, between the two ships and three expeditions, we got a lot of samples. And boy, there are a lot of samples. Uh, I have the, after, once you collect a lot of samples like that, they own you. You don't own them. Um, but so our, um, so these are the sampling points. The green regions here have no basaltic crust. The red regions have a thin crust. That uh, uh, and we have unusually fresh mammal peridotites, which from this talk I brought with me, and that's that's this sample here. 238, uh, this sample station 238. And uh, I invite you to come up after the talk and, and have, have to for yourself. It's quite heavy. Um, these prototype net rocks record ancient events. And this is a whole, I don't have time to uh, explain how we figured that out. And the volcanic rocks we sample, which include this basalt, are a different chemical composition than what we expected. So now I'm winding down towards the end of my talk here, uh, but, and I don't want the science kids 
to get in the way of the wonder of the whole thing. Um, the thinnest volcanic crust that we found uh, was more or less in line with predictions. These are the predictions, the correlation between the chemistry of the basalts and the crustal thickness on the x-axis here. And what we found is up here, we have very, very sodium-rich, doesn't matter what that means, sodium-rich basalt uh, and very thin crust. But the thing was, this sodium value varied quite a bit. And it didn't vary systematically with the crustal thickness along Capitol Ridge. It only varied on average. Uh, it only obeyed this relationship on average. Whereas some of the thickest parts uh, have the lowest sodium, and some of the thinnest parts have high sodium. But, it, uh, uh, but there's a whole structure here that is not connected at all by our theory of crust formation. That was a surprise. And that's why it was published in Nature. So let me. The print. Uh, it's there the slowest spreading mid ocean ridge. We knew that before. It's the thinnest ocean crust overall. We discovered that. Uh, anywhere in Europe, there's more volcanism than we expected in the western zone of Capital Ridge. And there are regions in central Capital Ridge that have no crust at all. And we don't have a really good explanation for why that is. Although there's some suggestion, all right, there, there, there's uh, some, some people have thoughts about it. I'm not sure I believe it. Um, there are, the, the more volcanic parts are heavily magnetized, the non-volcanic parts are not. That's a correlation that had not been, had been expected, but had not been established before. Uh, and the basalt and the mental compositions Locally, while they locally so they sort of conform to what we thought they would be, there are vast local variations that were far outside of what the predictions had been. And uh, we're still working on that. We have, we have students working on that right now. I have, uh, in my most recent paper published on that uh, sample set was last year, and we'll put, people will probably be working on these samples long after I'm gone. So the maps and samples together show a unique view into the Earth's mantle and of processes of volcano, volcano formation that we never had before. And so I'm very proud of my uh, privilege in having been able to be a part of this entire undertaking. Okay, but what have we really learned? Like from a human point of view, what was, what's the real uh, takeaway message? There are still mysteries on Earth to explore. There's still a lot that we don't know about how the inside of the Earth works. The very deepest parts of the Earth are still a hidden subject to us. And we, uh, there's a, uh, still a great need to understand our place as humans uh, in the universe by an exploration of the deep Earth. Volcanoes remain an uncontrollable superhuman phenomenon that scares the living daylights out of uh, everybody that goes near them. And there's still a major uh, method for constructing most of the crust that's underneath our feet or underneath the oceans. And we still <coughs> don't fully understand them. And the deepest parts of the Earth are even less well known. We know a lot more about other planets and even about the interiors of other planets than we really know about the interior of our own Earth. So there's a lot more um, uh, for us to learn about that. So thanks very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, John, for this fantastic talk. And questions for John. Uh, I missed the first 10 minutes of the, you know, with a quick summary of what Why, why, why are there volcanoes? Okay, thank you. Is that fair? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so here I think we've, we found out a little bit the why of volcanoes. Through studying this very remote place. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hmm? And the rest of the talk, there's an apple now, right? Yes? Yeah. Please. Um, so you mentioned that um, drift can mm -hmm. take place across, and that's really interesting to me, right? And I was wondering if that's just considered regular ocean current, or if that has to do with the polarity of the you know, so your were question is, metal? Were they, was it metal and were they, was it magnetic? What was the uh, Yeah, so the question is that about the drift of the farm through, uh, through what we now call the transpolar current. And did it have anything to do with the North Pole, the magnetic North Pole itself? Uh, interestingly, the magnetic pole isn't actually at the geographic North Pole. The magnetic North Pole is somewhere out in Canada. It's actually on land or down. Uh, and that's, that's a whole other chapter in the story of the exploration of the Arctic. But to answer your question, the transpolar drift is basically an ordinary ocean current, and also the Beaufort Gyre that goes around the, uh, what they call the Western Arctic. Uh, it's a regular ocean current. You know, it's just the top of the sea is this much ice, on average about two meters of ice. Uh, but that doesn't stop it from being an ocean current. Uh, yes? You said the tectonic plates spread. Mm -hmm. They're spreading the tectonic plates. Do they go back or do they just keep spreading? Yeah. Ah, so that's a very good question. Uh, and the question was that I said the tectonic plates are spreading apart. And if they're spreading apart, then they have to actually go together sometimes, right? And that's a whole other part of the. Of the uh, but so, in answer to your question, absolutely yes. There are. Uh, places where the tectonic plates slide together and where one plane is consumed, shoved back into the mantle uh, on top of the underneath the plate. Uh, that's, those are closer action to us. Yes? Uh, how many miles from the surface to the inner core? On the top of your head. Off the top of my head. And <laughs> I, I, should know, I should know this number exactly. It's 2,900 2, kilometers to the top of the outer core. What about miles? Miles. <laughs> uh, so that would, uh, I mean, I get this wrong. So I'd be about 5,000. No, 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 by the way. That would be about 1,500 miles uh, it's pretty deep. thick. And then to the top of the outer core. And then the outer core is about another 1,000 miles. But it's smaller, right? Because that's uh, you know, the the radius is a thousand miles, but the outer part of the Earth is much greater volume, uh, right? I'm not used to thinking in miles on this. Can you take a question here? I'm sorry, I'll get to you. Uh, over here, there was a question. Yes. Um, what was the specific? You gave like a specific reason for maybe why there was no volcanoes like near the central zone. Mm -hmm. Could you repeat what it was? Okay, so why is there no volcanism near the central zone? And, and this is actually, all right, this is another, uh, I, I'm afraid to admit this, uh, we don't really know. Uh, it certainly has something to do with the, uh, the way that magma flows on its way out of the mantle to accumulate in volcanic centers. Because, and I didn't say this in the talk, but the, the magnetism, let me see if I can back up that talk. Um, no, it doesn't seem to work back there. Okay. But, um, no, oh, there we go. The, the volcanic centers. It doesn't show up very well on this map, but the volcanic centers are highly localized. There's a lot of volcanoes in through here, and then suddenly there will be very few volcanoes. So we think that probably the mantle is upwelling and melting because of the process of decompression melting, and that the melt is being focused into these volcanic centers, where there's more volcanoes and thicker crust, and uh, these segments where the mantle is exposed, there's no thing generated there, but it's being sucked into the larger volcanic centers. That's the best we can do right now. But maybe, uh, 
you and your generation will find the answer to that question. That's that's where science is. Right. Yes. So, and then there was one over here. I forgot. So you said that there was portions where the mantle was exposed, but so that's as opposed to the farthest we've um, dug down, which was only like a quarter of the way to the mantle. There are just places in the Arctic that are deeper than that, that you could, like deeper than the Mariana Trench? Okay, so the question is, there are places where the mantle is exposed directly, and uh, we, the deepest we dug is maybe a quarter of the way to the mantle. And, and how can that be, essentially? And you know, it's a pretty simple answer to that. The, uh, the places that they drill are on the continent, and the mantle is farther away. Uh, just already by its nature. So even here in the oceans, the normal thickness of the mantle about five kilometers. We, we drilled twelve kilometers in the uh, on the continent, but still didn't get there. There is a project to drill all the way through the crust into the mantle, uh, but it hasn't gotten there yet. That was the original impetus for the start of the ocean drilling program: is to do that exact thing is to drill to the mantle, and we didn't get there yet. We drilled pieces of the mantle that are exposed, uh, plenty of those, but never all the way through the crust. That's one of the still major on. Yeah, sure, Paul. Yeah, so we, so we have made it, so like there are places where we can actually like touch the mantle directly. Yeah, right here on this table. <laughs> yes. And, but also this place. Uh, places like this, absolutely, where, where we've sampled. They tend to be under a lot of water, right? So it's uh, difficult to reach out and touch it. Uh, unless you're in a submarine, and even then you're in a submarine. So then why do they say the Mariana Trench is so deep? That's one. So the Mariana Trench is, one of the, is in one of these convergent zones. So there's a, a really thin crust all the way down to the mantle in the Mariana Trench, and so it's you would have to be part of go. See. Okay, wait, man. you've been waiting patiently, so I'm going to... What was the most challenging part of your like, expedition? The most challenging part of the expedition? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, people. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you, when, when you go out on an expedition, uh, Nobody can hide their true nature for longer than about two weeks. <laughs> you could be on good behavior for a while. Two weeks is about the limit, though. After two weeks, all kinds of like uh, uh, petty disagreements and difficulties. And when you're stuck in a tin can with each other, even though it's a pretty big tin can and pretty cushy and comfortable, then all kinds of uh, uh, little conflicts and sometimes not so little conflicts and People who are the slightest bit emotionally unstable, <laughs> uh, everything tends to get exaggerated when you're out and see stuck in the middle of the ice for months at a time. How does that cold? It's not that cold actually. Oh, okay. When we were out there, maybe it's not a bit like uh, Baton Rouge in January. Oh, okay. Most oh, of the time. Yeah, because this is the high Arctic summer. Oh, okay. So, uh, yes, question. Okay, so if I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear all of your questions. Let me see if I got it. So your question is, with new technology that exists, will we be able to drill through uh, all of the Earth's crust and maybe into the Earth's core? Uh, okay, so I think the limits of, and uh, I believe we have to kill the next here. Uh, there are basically the limits of uh, uh, deep drilling are thermal. Uh, it's, our, it's our ability to uh, keep the tools that we put down in the hole cool. And we do that through circulation of drilling fluid. But uh, as you drill deeper, the rocks get hotter and hotter and hotter. It's something called the geothermal gradient. And it becomes more and more difficult to uh, 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 to keep the tool cool and to remove the cuttings out of the hole. And, and so this is where the limits, where we've reached the limits of our ability to drill 
is simply uh, thermal failure of the drill bit. And, um, but so that said, it is probably possible to drill through the ocean crust. And this is still an objective. This is what we started out trying to do, is drill all the way through the ocean crust. We discovered several other um, fields of science in the process of not drilling through the ocean crust, but eventually we're going to do it. Uh, and but probably the limits in the oceans are somewhere around somewhere around seven to eight kilometers because the ocean crust has a hotter per geothermal gradient. Probably we've reached as deep as we're ever going to drill in the continental crust, which was 12 kilometers. And we still weren't out of the crust. And still we still at that point probably were uh, only I'm not sure about if it was a quarter of the way, maybe as much as half of the way. Uh, we could drill someplace else and maybe be halfway, but uh, probably we can make it through the ocean crust. We just have to let it go. Why don't we just drill through the mantle that's already exposed? Why don't we just drill through the mantle that's already exposed? Uh, and in fact, we have done it. Uh, so we found places, they were remarkably difficult to find and remarkably difficult to get to. So for example, this, this bit of mantle has got ice on top of it. It makes it very, very difficult drilling target um, with all of the ice there. You need ice breakers and so forth to keep the uh, drilling ship uh, able to access the mission floor. But the, this was actually done this year, a long section of mantle rock drilled from the ocean floor in another part of the ocean down the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Whether, we're not sure that that was actually rooted down. We were sure that this is a rooted piece of crustless matter. But it doesn't matter. It's still matter rocks. So, so if the mantle exposure is so rare, how much is that water and that rock worth? Uh, how much is that rock worth? I'd say you can't put a value on it, really. Uh, I, uh, I, would hate to put a, I would hate to put a price on it, but it's a lot. <laughs> Certainly, it's valuable to the mankind. Yes. So you showed at the beginning a picture of a polar bear, mm -hmm. but you never talk about it. So I just. <laughs> 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 and uh, so uh, and I assume everybody heard that because I've got the first time all around. No, well, we did see lots of polar bears. Uh, but the polar bears make their living just also like people do, but live in the ice margin. They, they make their living uh, killing things that uh, swim around in the water. So it's mostly they're looking for seals. The polar bears are looking for seals, and the seals are chasing fish. And uh, it's part of the Arctic ecosystem. They're also walrus. We didn't see any of those. There are also whales. We did see whales. Whales would swim right up to the ship and poke their eye out and flop their head looking at us. We saw that on several occasions. And it was just really fantastic. And then, uh, but once you get up into the hot Arctic, there's almost nothing. You don't see any, no polar bears, no whales. Even though there's open water, um, the, the uh, wildlife seems to stick down at the what we call lower latitudes. Yes? Are there any um, expeditions currently happening or, or proposed? Or so there are. So the question was: Are there expeditions currently happening or proposed? And there, there have been some, and there are some. Uh, not nothing on this scale. This was a really epic expedition. These uh, these ones that we did. They mostly tend to be uh, investigating a single aspect of some part of the uh, seafloor in the Arctic. And also, there's the international law of the sea treaty that allows a nation that investigates uh, parts of the continent that are connected to their continent uh, and claim them for natural resource extraction. And so both Canada and the US and Russia currently are uh, exploring some of the bits of continental parts, not Dakar Ridge but some of them, like the Long Nassau Ridge on this side, and on this side, the Long Nassau Ridge is a sliver of continental crust. I didn't get to talk about that. But they're exploring those very rapidly. 
The problem is that the U.S. is running out of ice-breaking ships. Our ice-breaking ships have been retired, uh, and currently there's only two, and they mostly spend their time servicing McMurrah Station in the south. So we don't really have the resources in the Arctic as a, as a nation to uh, be able to explore the Arctic Ocean thoroughly. And this is actually something, there's a recent news article about that, uh, people trying to uh, correct that situation. Yes? Uh, in the last example, uh, was there any kind of like precious jewels, gold or anything like that? Just got a curiosity. Precious jewels, kind of gold, no. Uh, we, uh, uh, maybe almost certainly under the continental margins of all of the Arctic nations is oil. Ah, right? And uh, that there's no question about that. In fact, you know, the, the American Arctic, the Alaskan Arctic uh, continental shelf is certainly just an extension of yes. the uh, Arctic National Wildlife Reserve, where, which is well known as being a place that people would like to drill for, for oil, but currently is, uh, uh, are not able to. Right? And, and so all the Arctic nations are thinking about it, particularly since, because of climate change, the uh, Arctic continental shelves are much more accessible than they used to be. It's also a lot quieter than a lot of the other continental shelves, just from a weather perspective. There aren't the, there isn't the Arctic sea states uh, offshore in the Arctic that there are even here in Louisiana. Or well, shall we, or shall we, uh, that, we, I think we should, uh, yeah, yeah, one, 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 one